Some viewers may find this disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. New Year, everybody, and we got more videos to talk about. Give me a moment, let me get Rasa out here. Putting some ground rules of not putting the belt on me while I'm in the bathroom. What am I reviewing if it's a purple key? We're gonna be working on He Man and the Masters of the Universe Revolution. BB, everyone already tore that show and you a hole. Why am I doing one? With Revolution on the way, we might as well see how Revelation holds up. Tension. Oh, Okay, let's review it. Oh, the landlord's gonna rip me a new one for that window. He-Man is a Frankenstein creation taking Conan the Barbarian and adding sci-fi magic, making something to a series that boys would enjoy playing in a toy format. If you want a true history of what He-Man is, we'll put a link in the description about everything about He-Man. But most people remember it from its filmation version, where it balances cheesy action, adventure, and besides a limited budget and reusing footage, it gives us a lot of seasons to enjoy and riff on. And it was so popular enough it even had a spinoff series. And in 2021, Netflix decided to do a continuation of the story, calling it Masters of the Universe Revelation. With barely any He-Man. He-Man's barely in it. Yeah, the title of the series should have been called Masters of the Universe, Teela's Revelation, because this is a massive bait and switch. Episode 1 did a good job setting everything up, showing how the new updates is going on, and showing Skeletor attacking Castle Grayskull, which tries to be serious, and I like how they all kept it serious toned. Though I will admit, the death of Moss Man was so fast, after watching it the first time, I thought that was Grayskull's defense mechanism. So apologies to all the Moss Man fans. We have Skeletor finally knowing the power of Grayskull, which... Did he forget why he was after it, or was it just a secret temple that he wanted in? Which, due to Skeletor tricking He-Man into unlocking the secrets, which is a magic so powerful it can tear apart reality. And in a last-ditch effort, He-Man used his sword as a conduit, breaking it into two to stabilize the world but killing him and Skeletor in the process. And with the last moment, Tila saw that He-Man was actually Prince Adam, to which leads to the most infamous thing of the series. Tila's bitching. If after that whole great explosion and Adam was still there alive, it would have been justified for what she does and leaves. But since he passed away, I can name a list of things that actually winds up her complaining. Number one, Attorney just lost their great defender. Number two, the kingdom just lost their heir to the throne. They're still Princess Adora. The least we talk about Adora, the better. And I'm surprised with how this show is running. They didn't bring her into this. Number three, the parents just lost their child. And you're given a reason you suck speech. Number four, the king's in the same boat as you. He didn't know anything about it. And I am surprised when she did that whole complaining, he didn't throw her to the dungeon. She just says, screw you guys, I'm leaving. The next episode, some time has passed, and Taylor's looking more like she came from Mad Max, and she even has her companion, Andra, whose backstory is simple. She was raised on the streets after the death of her father. That's it. What? She's basically Taylor's cheerleader. Any time that needs to use their brain and involves technology, she's involved. And any time Tila's saying, I don't want to do this mission, she's always there saying, please, 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 because she's a Master of the Universe fangirl. That's the only reason why Tila's doing most of these missions. Because people are pleading with her to do it. I'm surprised none of them have puppy dog eyes. We see how the world is doing with magic dying and tech is now on the rise. We even have a tech called Formed by Triclops, which makes sense using nanomachines, which is turning people into cyborgs. But you lost me when the nano machine somehow managed to make a buzzsaw and a flamethrower out of the normal human body. And this is all coming from a cup, which is actually the remains of Skeletor's staff, and the person who requested for all this was Evil Lynn. Okay, how did she lose the staff? How did it become a cup? And I thought she was Skeletor's right hand. How did she get booted out from the whole group? You gotta remember, BV, 
they're only limited to five episodes. They have to make each scene count, even though they should really work on show, don't tell, instead of getting a massive exposition dump. As this is needed for a mission from the dying sorceress, that the planet is dying without the magic. And the only way to fix it is they need to find and restore the Sword of Power, which both halves are in Paternia and Saturnia. Andrew wants to do this. Tila has no care about this and does not want to do it. She only reconsiders when Cringer convinces her. And to restore the sword, they need to find Man-at-Arms. The next episode, they're searching for Man-at-Arms in this village. They end up getting attacked by the tech cult. Like for them, they are rescued by Man-at-Arms and Beast-Man. I mean, they should have had another couple of episodes to explain, like, the fallout. We're just getting time passed. I'm questioning, where, how did this tech cult form? Why are some heroes and villains working together? Why does a lot of the previous villains have gripe with Evil Inn? It leads to so many questions you want answer. And then again, based on how this series is going, if you did get the answers, you're going to get irritated. The only importance is that they recruit Beastman and Orko who is dying because of the limited magic left in the world. They're bringing the equivalency of a cancer patient on a long journey. Yeah, I don't get it. Writers, can anyone explain to me why bringing a dying man on a world-saving journey would help you? And Roboto, because he has all the knowledge that her father has, as he goes to Grayskull to protect the sorceress from the tech cult. Wouldn't it make more sense for him to be already at Grayskull protecting her? That's because they needed to reconcile here before she goes to Saturnia. I think it would have been better for him to reconcile early and for that to be the reason for her to do this mission. Yeah, yeah. But also at the same time, she wouldn't have had her three new members joining her at the exact moment. They travel to Saturnia. Which is basically the underworld or hell, take her guess. They are all hit by an illusionary spell which separates them. Beastman, Roboto, and Andrea are fighting Shadow Beast because they need them to do something in this episode. Evelyn and Orko are in a version of Trolla, which somehow they find out all the citizens of Trolla are dead. Oh! Yeah, I was wondering about that. As Trolla is another dimension, another world, so the Magical Eternia connects to all the worlds. They add more to this story that Orko's a crap magician, which in the original filmation was explained Orko's talented, it's just an Eternia. His skills are just stuck in an inverted control, though the same series also explains Orko needs an item to help do magic better. Also, 80s cartoons had a shotgun approach to when it came to canon. Yeah, but also 80s cartoons were mostly just made to sell merchandise than anything else. Also, he said he couldn't say his name right when he was young, and his original name is Orgle. Funny, I thought his original name was Gorbo. While Tila is battling against Scareglow, which is kind of like the Grim Reaper or Satan. To which her battle is her fighting He-Man and herself. To which her fear is that she's afraid of her own power. If her fear is the fear of her own power, why is she fighting an illusionary version of He-Man? More likely, Vivi, since there wasn't enough He-Man for the first episode in the flashbacks, they need to add more He-Man for the trailers to bait everybody to keep watching the series. Well, she won the fight and got the sword half, but since she didn't fight Scareglow and they were in his domain, they have to escape, using the half of the sword to open up a portal to Paternia, but Orko stays behind to hold Scareglow off. Okay, so we have a warrior, a mage who could hold herself in a fist fight, a beast man, a tech whiz, and a robot, and they decide to send in the mage who couldn't even use his magic properly if the world was magically aligned. I think they wanted to do that for an emotional gut punch since they're killing off the comic relief. Oh, 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 give me a moment. Okay, I am sad now. Stop being a dick! I could justify that. They gave Orko's sad emotional story to Eva Lynn, a character he didn't spend enough time with. Heck. He spent more time with Beastman than anything. The final episode, they made it to Paternia, and they give Orko a burial stone. Which this place is like Valhalla. Wait a minute. Orko died a warrior's death? How come he's not here? You're overthinking. No, they're underthinking. Well, they met heroes from the past and Adam, and they got the second half of the sword, 
from the first wielder, Hero. While the Allies are fixing the Sword of Power, to get it together it comes at a price, to which they lost Roboto putting the sword together. And it makes it more sadder as I felt there was a better relationship with Andrea and Roboto than Tila and Adam. As throughout that whole time with Tila and Adam together, she is still complaining about the fact why he didn't tell her. I wish Ryan would stop doing the whole, how come you didn't tell me about your secret identity? <sighs> There's a reason why a lot of people don't want to reveal a secret identity. The less you know, the better. And sometimes if everybody knows, because sometimes there's people with loose lips, the villain will hear and use the non-superpowered individuals as a hostage or kill them to hurt the superpowered individual. Also, who in the right mind an attorney would send in the heir to the throne in the front line of battle in any situation? This is one of those moments I wished Adam didn't die when, he, when that all happens. He just lost his powers. The story would have still went the same way in a way. It's just that when Tila was asked to fix this thing, Adam will be there to try to give her a reason to actually do this instead of we get some cringer pleading. That way, throughout the whole time, it could be Adam and Tila building up a relationship again of a friendship. And also, we show that Adam's a skilled fighter even without that power sword. And there, when we get to Paternia, the, the emotional thing would actually feel better about them to fixing it instead of just some last minute, oh yeah, you did all this stuff. I mean, it shows how more caring Adam is as he decided he should go back with them alive. And there's a price for doing that. If he does that and he dies again, he can never come back here. They make it back to Grey Skull to fix the flow of magic, only for Skeletor to be hiding in Evelyn's staff and at the right moment stabs Adam in the back just before he transforms. Just to remind you, he was in that staff, which was captured by the cult and used as a ceremonial drinking cup. It would be funny to hear his thoughts throughout that whole time he was captured. Nah, this one's breast smells worse than Skunk Man on a bad day. Who said that? And with the power of Grayskull in his hand, Skeletor raises it and, and becomes Skeletor. And that was Tila's revelation. Dear God, sucked. Tila's revelation is or attempt of doing a He-Man series, as it's supposed to be a continuation of the filmation version. They have no idea that the filmation version of He-Man had the ending of all of them together, explaining what happened to the ones who weren't there, and happy that the mission was successful, Comic Relief does something funny, and everyone laughs with a life lesson at the end that connects to the story. This feels like we were in the middle of a season. We didn't even get season one or two. And look, there are things I do like about the show. Its animation is beautiful. I love the action scenes. But the story is supposed to be the core of a show and art is second. Look, you can have a beautiful work of art, but if you're drawing a turd, it's still a turd. Just highly detailed. I mean, look, we're following Tila, who is shown to be unlikable, and I tried my best not to bring up her as a Mary Sue. Andrea was just there to get Tila to do the missions, as she's a Master of the Fiend Universe fangirl. I didn't get much about her, these Man and Evelyn are just there for the twist, and let's bring up the issue of the twist. In the trailer, shown He-Man a lot, only to kill him off in the first episode. And to end it on a note where Adam could be dead again shows the twist is more important than anything else. So what's the revelation of this series? That there's a He-Man series on Netflix that did a better job than this one. Now that it's over, I can get rid of this. still here. Usually it vanishes after I shoot it. I think it's because of the fact that this is half a season. Netflix does this weird thing where they take one season, cut it in half to say it's two. So there you could watch the first half and more likely you'll have to repay again to watch the second half when they release that at a later date. Okay then, so I'll, we'll do it the next video. It can't be that big of a deal. I'm pretty sure it BB, the key's not coming out! I, I, I'm I, stuck in this room! Well, that's the issue. You can't take the key out of the gun until the review is over. <laughs> Don't worry, the gun program not to kill him. Though, he is stunned for the moment. He'll be back to normal. See you all next week, everybody!